Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome back to the uh, second week of the semester and uh, second week of CS206. Uh, um, as always, uh, just a reminder about the schedule to give you an idea of uh, where we've been, where we are and where we're going. And uh, just a reminder, if you haven't already, click through to the uh, attendance sheet for today and just mark yourself uh, as here. Okay, uh, hopefully by 11.59 p.m. last night, uh, most if not all of you managed to submit assignment one. Can you just type uh, yes in chat if you managed to submit assignment one on time? Just so we can get a rough idea of, of how we're doing here. Okay, lots of yeses appearing, that's good to know. Okay, um, for those of you that uh, are struggling with the logistics of how to submit assignment one or the logistics of installing, great, good to see so many yeses. Uh, those of you that are still struggling with installation issues, uh, PyBullet or PyroSim, please do come and see Amanda and I during our office hours this week. As a reminder, all of these programming assignments are cumulative, so if you start to fall behind, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to catch up. If you cannot make it uh, to either Amanda's or I, my office hours, shoot us an email or shoot us a note in Teams and I'm sure we can arrange to meet you uh, at another time. Okay, so that's assignment one. As promised, uh, every Tuesday morning I will uh, assign the next assignment, which again is due uh, next Monday, February the 15th at 11.59 p.m. Okay, so what are you going to be doing in assignment? Uh, what are you going to be doing in assignment two? So in assignment one, you just finished uh, figuring out what a what a link is, and in assignment two, you're going to be creating uh, multiple links, and then in part two of assignment two, you're going to be connecting those links together uh, with joints. As I mentioned in um, as I mentioned. In class at some point the name uh, links is a little bit confusing because it suggests links between objects all the objects you're going to be creating uh, in your virtual world are going to be referred to as links and the things that connect them together are uh, joints okay any questions about assignment one assignment two all good so far okay all right, so um, back to uh, lecture material then. We're going to finish up today uh, the first uh, module in the course, which is an introduction and sort of looking at the much larger landscape of artificial intelligence and robotics. And then situating embodied uh, evolutionary robotics, which is a relatively small branch of robotics, at least at the moment, within that larger landscape. So we got part of the way through uh, lecture series two. Uh, last time we'll finish off lecture uh, series two now and move on to our third discussion on embodied uh, cognition. Okay, so we started our history of AI last time all the way back in the 1600s with our friend uh, Rene Descartes who made this distinction between brain and body. We jumped ahead then to the 20th century and Alan Turing and the Turing machine forward again to 1956 with the first mention of the world or the word artificial intelligence so you can sort of date the history of AI from the summer of 1956. Uh, and we talked a little bit last time about uh, throughout this history sort of what are the main goals of, of robotics in general. They are to understand or to use robots as a scientific tool to investigate what forms intelligence takes in biological systems. As we study that, can we abstract down the principles of intelligence into general principles or very well-defined descriptions of intelligent behavior? As mentioned in the workshop in 1956, if we can describe the various aspects of intelligence in enough detail, we should be able to turn those descriptions of intelligence into machines and algorithms and apply them to intelligent artifacts. Okay. Um, we looked at Eliza last time from the 1960s, the first chatbot. Uh, we looked at a second of Alan Turing's contributions way back at the beginning uh, of AI, which is the Turing test. Turing argued that we will never be able to define what intelligence is, but we'll know it when we see it. 
and we'll see it in the course of a Turing test. We ended last time uh, in the 1980s, or in 1980, with John Searle's rebuttal to the Turing test, which took the form of a thought experiment of the Chinese room. Searle attempted to prove that you could create an unthinking system, which is the Chinese room, that would pass the Turing test, and therefore the Turing test is not a good measure of intelligence. I took a poll at the end of last class, and most of, most of you seem to agree with John Searle, and I'm not going to try and convince you out of your point of view. Um, the point is, if you agree with John Searle that whatever is going on inside the human skull is different from what's going on inside the Chinese room, it is on you, the onus is on you to prove what that difference is. Personally, in my professional opinion, no one since 1980 has been able to clearly articulate what that difference is. Um, there have been many, many attempts to do so, and we do not have time uh, in, uh, in the span of this course to go into them. For those of you that are interested in the history and the philosophy of AI, looking at the argument back and forth between the Turing point of view and the Searle point of view uh, is extremely interesting. Okay. Um, let's move forward into the mid-1980s uh, with the publication of the book called uh, Vehicles. Um, this was published by Valentino Breitenberg, a very world-renowned uh, neurophysiologist, meaning he studied uh, the physiology of the brain. Not human brains in Professor Breitenberg's case, but fruit flies. Uh, again, for those of you that live in student housing, you're probably very familiar with the fruit fly. If there's any rot rotting fruit or vegetables, lying around anywhere, you'll start to find these fruit flies. Um, uh, if you take a piece of fruit and put it in one corner of the room and you release fruit flies in the other corner of the room, they will very quickly figure out where that fruit is and fly towards it. Um, uh, in the decades before Breitenberg published his book, uh, in the literature there, report, there were hypotheses or ideas about what was going on inside the brain of a fruit fly to allow it to be able to hover in three-dimensional space, orient towards the odor plume being given off by the rotting fruit or vegetable, and fly towards it. Uh, a lot of people claim that fruit flies were performing a differential calculus uh, in their heads and using that to, to turn towards the gradient of increasing odor plume and then fly towards it. There were a lot of very, uh, there were a lot of theories in the literature about extremely complicated cognition. And Breitenberg, who actually operated on fruit fly brains, you know how, how small a fruit fly is, you can imagine how small a fruit fly, fry, fruit fly brain is. Breitenberg was not convinced that you could pack differential calculus into such an extremely small uh, brain. He came up with his own hypotheses about how fruit flies might orient towards an odor plume and was able to actually come up with exceedingly simple explanations that seemed to explain the behavior of the fruit fly much, much easier, uh, much simpler uh, explanations than differential calculus. That led him to a bigger realization beyond fruit flies, which is that it seemed that his colleagues and people in general seemed to attribute a lot of complexity to brains and that complexity may not actually be there. In the case of the fruit fly, what differential calculus was not necessary. So maybe people are overestimating what brains do. And in order to make this argument, he wrote this very uh, interesting book called Vehicles. Uh, like most great works of art or great books, you can read vehicles on many different levels. Uh, it's less than 100 pages long. It's a great read. It's optional reading for this course. A surface reading um, of this book, if, if, you, if you do a surface reading of this book, it'll come off like a fairy tale. So it's broken up into a series of chapters. Each Some of these chapters begin with once upon a time there was a vehicle and this vehicle had X, Y, and Z, and it did X, Y, and Z. So let's start with chapter one. In chapter one, Breitenberg introduces vehicle one. And he uses this term vehicle uh, in his, his purpose was to use this term to not refer to specific machines or organisms. It was meant to be a term that would, that would span 
bo both biological and artificial machines. Obviously for us, a vehicle tends to, to, to suggest a, a car or, or something technological. We're gonna use Breitenberg's use of the word vehicles to refer to just a hypothetical thing. Uh, and this thing in vehicle one has the following uh, uh, elements. As a body, like you can see here, we're looking at vehicle one from above. Vehicle one has a single sensor that's attached at the front and a single motor attached at the back. And there is a single wire that attaches the single sensor to the single uh, motor. Um, such that, uh, I'm sorry, and the sensor in this case is a temperature sensor. So the higher the temperature, the stronger the reading of this sensor. And because there's a wire connecting the sensor to the motor, the higher the temperature recorded by the sensor, the faster the wheel will turn. The lower the temperature recorded by the sensor, the slower the wheel will turn. This is pretty much the simplest possible robot you can imagine. One body, one sensor, one motor, and one connection between the sensor and motor. Okay. If you think about this simple machine moving through a very, an environment with fluctuating temperatures, it doesn't, it's not hard to figure out what this thing will do. It will always move in a straight line. It has one wheel that can go faster or slower. The wheel cannot turn. So it always goes in a straight line. And obviously it's gonna move slower in cold uh, regions and speed up in warm water. Okay, or warm, warm regions. Breitenberg uh, asks you to imagine now what you would think if you saw such a vehicle that was swimming around in a pond. We could put this obviously uh, on the ground and take air temperature or put it in a pond and take water temperature. It's restless, you would say, and does not like warm water, but it is quite stupid since it's not able to turn back to the nice cold spot that it overshot in its restlessness. Anyway, if you didn't know that this was a vehicle, something made from artificial parts, you would probably say it's alive since you've never seen a particle of dead matter that moves in quite this way. This is a world-renowned neurophysiologist talking about restlessness. This agent doesn't like warm water. It's quite stupid. Uh, it's going to be frustrated that it overshot uh, the nice cold spot that it seems to like because it seems to slow down and hang out in cold water. Why would a neurophysiologist use this kind of language? It's clear from looking at vehicle one that vehicle one uh, cannot be restless. There is no restless circuit in the brain of this vehicle. There is no like or dislike circuit in the brain of this vehicle. It's not smart or stupid, or maybe you would say it's stupid because there isn't much that it can do. It can't regret missing the cold shot that it over, uh, overshot. And obviously if we make this out of metal and ceramics and, and electronics, although I guess there's no electronics here, it's clearly not alive. It seems like very, uh, a very strange language for a very serious scientist to be using. Okay, let's go on. In chapter two, Breitenberg introduces a pair of uh, vehicles. Um, the first one, 2A, is uh, what he refers to as the aggressor. As you can see, the aggressor here uh, has more or less the same uh, has more or less the same structure as vehicle one. It has a body. We're looking from above. In this case, however, it has two sensors, front left and front right, and it has two motors, back left and back right, and it has two wires, one connecting the left sensor to the right motor, and another wire that's connecting the right sensor to the left motor. This is known as contralateral connections. I'll just type that into chat there for you. Contra meaning across or against, lateral meaning line or the line of the body. So we have crossed uh, connections. Um, your, the visual pathways in your brain are also contralateral. The signals arriving at your right eye are passed in to the uh, part of the brain uh, at the back left of your skull. And signals arriving at your left eye are processed by the part of your brain that's near the back right of your skull. Okay, that's contralateral. We'll see uh, the opposite case in a moment. 
Okay, if you were to take, build such a machine and then come at this machine with a flashlight from front left, like you see in this picture, it would turn towards, would turn to the, the left, it would turn towards the right. Why? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Why is this machine the aggressor? Why does it turn and face off against this flashlight? So I've told you what the behavior is. It's going to turn towards the light. Can you give me an explanation of that behavior using the language of its structure, how this robot is built, its sensors and motors and contralateral connections? So Henry says the right wheel is connected to the left sensor and vice versa. That's right. So that's the structure. Why does that structure produce this particular behavior, turning towards the left? As Hannah mentions, the left sensor, which as you can see in the cartoon here, is closer to the light, meaning that there is more light falling on the left sensor than the right sensor, which means the left sensor is flashing or is recording a stronger signal than the right sensor. And because that has a, the left sensor has a strong signal, because it's connected to the right wheel, that means the right wheel is going to turn fast. The right sensor, which is receiving less light, is turning the left wheel slower. So if the right wheel is spinning faster than the left wheel, then obviously it's going to turn towards the light. If it does turn and now it's facing the light head on, what does the behavior do? What does the robot do at the next moment in time? The aggressor is now facing the flashlight. Shauna says it stays still. Ben says the opposite, which is what will actually happen. Both sensors now see the light, and because the robot has just turned towards the light, the values that are exactly uh, the val the light values that are arriving at both light sensors are now equal and stronger than they were a moment before the robot had turned towards the light. So it's turned towards the light. The signals arriving at both sensors have increased in strength and they're both equal, which means, as Ben says, the robot will charge. It'll not only move directly towards the light. Both light sensors are equal, meaning the speed of both wheels is equal, which means it's now moving straight. The values are now stronger, which means the wheels move faster and it's going to move towards the light. And the moment it gets closer to the light, both sensor values are now registering even stronger values. It's going to accelerate even faster. And if uh, instead of a flashlight, you have a naked light bulb, the aggressor will smash into this bul bulb and destroy it. This, uh, the aggressor hates light above all things. Any questions about that? Make sense? Does the aggressor hate light? Or does it fear light and want to destroy the light? Seems like a ridiculous question, right? Of course, the aggressor does not hate. There is no hate circuit in here. There are simply two wires. Okay, let's have a look at vehicle 2B here, which has ipsilateral connections. It's exactly the same as the aggressor, two light sensors and two motors. But now we have same side or ipsilateral connections. The left sensor is wired to the left motor and the right sensor is wired to the right motor. What does this robot do if you come at it with a flashlight from the front right, like you see in the picture here? It will turn away from the light because now it'll turn to the left, it'll turn away from the light. Why? Give me a description 
in terms of the sensors and connections and motors. The right sensor, as George says, the right sensor uh, speeds up the right wheel, turning it away. Exactly. The right tire turns faster. The right sensor is connected to the right wheel, which means the stronger light signal arriving at the right sensor causes the right wheel to spin faster than the left wheel, which is receiving a, a weaker signal from the left sensor. Hopefully most of you can see this. Uh, Breitenberg referred to this as the coward. This one will turn away from the light. Let's do the same thing as we did with the aggressor. Let's imagine that the coward has uh, uh, moved, has turned slightly away from the light. What happens at the next moment in time? It's now oriented, uh, facing a little bit away from the light, and it's also by turning actually moved a little bit away from the source of the light. What does the coward do at the next moment in time? It stops, possibly. Um, depending on the sensors, whether they're omnidirectional or not, so whether it can see behind it, if we assume that there is a shield behind the sensor so that it can no longer see the light at all, it will stop. Or if it can see behind it, like Ethan says, um, the robot might just slow down a little bit because the two sensors are still registering the flashlight, which is now behind the robot, but it's turned away. So both values of the sensors are lower, meaning the wheels are moving slower. And as it moves further away, it's going to slow down and slow down and may come to a stop. What happens if the person holding the flashlight starts chasing after the, uh, the robot from behind? What will happen? Assuming the robot can see behind itself. It'll run away, right? It's, it's the coward. The coward is afraid of light among, uh, uh, above all things. Everything else it really doesn't care about because it literally cannot see anything else other than light. It's the coward. Okay, I want to make two points about uh, the vehicles in general. The first one is that this is probably the simplest robot you're going to see in the course, but it already illustrates a lot of what makes um, robotics interesting and unique from a lot of other work in artificial intelligence. For those of you that have ever taken a deep learning course or know anything about neural networks, in a neural network you present an image or a YouTube video with a cat in it, you, that signal arrives at the input to the neural network, values flow through the neural network, and at the output of the network, you hope that the network will say cat. If you present uh, an image or a YouTube video with a human face in it, the values flow through the neural network, and you hope at the output you get the signal human or face or male or female or, or whatever it is. That's often known, uh, so you have sort of input processing and output. Uh, all neural networks and all machine learning in general typically has that pattern. You present a pattern at the input, the machine learning algorithm or the AI method does some internal processing and provides an output. I'll pause there for a moment. Lucas has a question. Um, if the coward is facing directly towards the light at the start, um, it will charge, right? It's an excellent question. Let's try and answer Lucas's question. So let's place the coward so that it's facing directly towards the light. What will happen? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. This one is actually a little tricky. It's a good observation, Lucas. Good question. What happens in the case of the coward? Uh, we'll assume it cannot move backwards. The wheels either turn forward, slower or faster, depending on the signals arriving at the light sensors. If the robot is in pitch blackness, so both sensors are registering zero, then the wheels just don't turn. Uh, ben says, assuming it can only move forward, it should either slow down to a crawl or stop. 
Maybe. Let's think very carefully about the robot's relationship with its environment. Jonathan says it'll drive straight forward, question mark. Let's think very carefully about the sensors. Let's assume we were to do this in real life. Let's say you, had, you actually had two physical light sensors. You put them on the robot and you face the robot directly towards the light and forget about the behavior of the robot for a moment. Let's just look at the numbers arriving at those two sensors. Tell me about those two numbers. I don't know what the units are for light intensity. Um, whatever they are, let's assume you have a measure, something that can measure that and report those two numbers. If you, if you place a, ro a physical robot, lumens, thank you. Okay, so you have so many lumens in the left and so many lumens in the right. You face the robot directly at the light. Tell me about those two numbers. Are they really equal? We're doing this in reality. Let's, assuming, let's assume those numbers are, fl are floating point numbers. Uh, M. Birach, I'm sorry, I don't know what your first name is, has figured it out. There is going to be a minuscule difference between the two sensor values. It may be 0. 0.0001 lumens different, but it is going to be different. It is the, the universe, the physical universe does not operate with integers, it operates with real numbers, right? So no matter how carefully you face the robot against the light, those two sensors are gonna register a minuscule difference. And this is a detail from the physical world, right? The fact that we're dealing with a robot, not a neural network that is shielded inside a computer and provided with ideal information. We're going to talk about this when we get to embodied and situated cognition in a moment, but the fact that this thing is a physical artifact matters. What's the impact on the behavior? So George says, uh, oh, George asks, but will the motor spin at a speed noticeable enough to turn away? That's a good question. So as we take these two real values, these two actual lumen uh, numbers and lumens, and we compute or we translate them into motor speeds, there may be a rounding, we may round the number to a, the closest integer at some point. And if we do, you're right, then the robot will go straight. Assume that's what, what is inside the robot is analog and not digital. The real numbers arriving at the sensors are going to be real uh, velocities that we're gonna to supply to the motors or real force, uh, torques, if you like. We'll talk about torques uh, in a few weeks when we talk about physical simulation. Torque is just uh, rotational force. So if you twist, if you're applying force to twist the top off a bottle, you're applying torque, rotational force. Okay. So if everything is analog, the two sensor values are slightly different, what's going to happen at the motors? Slight difference between the two sensor values. What's going to happen at the, the motors and then the wheels? As Missy mentions, the robot will move in the direction of the lower lumen value. Actually, it'll move. Uh, it'll move. That's right. It'll move in the direction of the lower one, and that's going to increase the difference in the sensor values, which will increase the rate at which it's turning away from the light. So no matter how closely you face the robot towards the light, it will always veer away from the light. Exactly. Okay. So again, two, two messages we want to take away from the Breitenberg vehicles. The first one is that this is a very simple robot, but it differs from neural networks and most other machine learning algorithms in the following way. Neural networks and machine learning algorithms sit and wait for input. They process it and provide an output. Our Breitenberg vehicle does the same thing. It gets sensor values. Those values travel along these two wires to the motors, and then the robot does something. But a robot, unlike a neural network, is now going to act in its world. Those output values cause behavior. In the case of our robot, it causes it to move a little bit. 
That behavior changes the robot's relationship to its environment. In this case, it just turns a little bit away from the light. That changed relationship with the environment causes changes in the sensor values. So a robot has a closed loop. Much of machine learning and, and artificial intelligence has focused on sense, think, act. Get the picture with a cute cat in it from the YouTube, process it and produce a single action, which is to light up the cat neuron. But robots have a backward loop as well that goes from action to reaction. Motor values affect the robot and its environment, which in turn change sensor values. So we have this closed loop that goes from sense, think, act, to act and uh, sensory repercussion. Uh, another way I like to talk about this is a robot, unlike a neural network, pushes against its world and observes how the world pushes back. A robot acts and observes the repercussions or senses the repercussions of its actions. That is the most important distinction between robotics and AI that we're going to talk about in this course. Okay, the other point I want you to take away from the Breitenberg vehicles is this very strange language that Breitenberg is using. In chapter one, he introduces uh, a machine that seems to be restless uh, and so on. In uh, 2A and 2B, he introduces robots that uh, uh, hate and fear. Why would a very serious neuroscientist use this kind of language? He, above all others, would realize that clearly the, Brayton, the, the vehicle here is not fearing or hating or uh, regretting or feeling restness, restlessness. If you go on and read the rest of the book, as you can probably imagine, chapters three and onward introduce slightly more complex robots but, or vehicles, but they're not that much more complicated. And he uses this very, uh, this very strange language. Aside from trying to make the point that you can get relatively uh, useful behavior, like following light or moving away from it, um, as Zachary mentions, what Breitenberg is pointing out is this concept of anthropomorphization. If, if you didn't know what was inside the vehicle, or I showed you a grainy video of one of these vehicles at work and the, the quality of the video was so bad that you couldn't tell whether this was a robot made out of Legos or an actual organism, you might describe it as being afraid of the light, running away, somebody said charging the light. All of those verbs imply intent, some sort of internal state, self-awareness. Uh, humans tend to anthropomorphize or attribute more into what's going on inside the brain of an organism or, or machine as might be there. Most people are entertained when they read the vehicles because of this, this uh, language that's being used. And you kind of laugh at yourself thinking, of course, the aggressor doesn't doesn't fear and hate. Only organisms do that, and especially humans. We love, we hate, we regret, we're restless, we're sleepy, uh, and so on. These simple machines are not that. We are different. Whatever we are, we are not vehicles. You can imagine what happens in the rest of the book. Breitenberg makes it increasingly difficult for you to actually articulate what that difference is. Okay, uh, your cognitive dis uh, distinctiveness or our species cognitive distinctiveness is now on the line. How are we different from vehicles? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. If I don't see anything in chat, I'll just assume you all think that there's no difference between us and vehicles. What's the difference? We are not simply machines with a bunch of wires inside like the vehicles. We're different. We meaning humans or, or higher animals, if you like. We have emotions, right? We, we, we think, we fear, we regret, and so on. We have more sensors. So there's a clear difference between us and uh, vehicles. So 2A and 2B have two wires inside them. You can think of these as synaptic connections between neurons. Humans have around 10 to the 15 synapses. 
We have way more than vehicles. But is it just quantity or is it quality? Okay, so I see uh, adaptation, consciousness, emotions, autonomy. Uh, we have autonomy, right? Uh, free will. We can decide to stop hating and loving instead. We are different. Okay. We talked about that when we talked about the Chinese room. Um, we can use these terms like consciousness and adaptation and emotion. But if I was to push you further, I'd ask for a definition of what those are. And ultimately, if you really believe that you are different because you are conscious or have free will or you adapt or you have emotions, I want a description of what those things are as a function of sensors, wires and motors, or in our case, sense organs, synaptic connections, and muscles. For some of us, the difference might be mind or soul or spirit or what have you. Um, you may fall back on a, a spiritual or religious definition of what distinguishes us from vehicles, and that's also perfectly fine, but we've obviously left the realm of science at that point, and we can no longer have a discussion about the differences in scientific terms. If you are a materialist, meaning you believe we have free will and consciousness and emotions and so on, but all of those things, whatever they are, can ultimately be defined just as brain chemistry or the whatever is going on electrically in the brain, that there is no other substance in there like soul or spirit or aura. We don't have a definition for that yet, obviously. People in the field are split about whether we will ever have such a description or not. Most people who read vehicles, regardless of what your opinion on, on this subject is, are left with a sort of uncomfortable feeling that maybe it's more difficult to defend or define exactly what, uh, what distinguishes us from vehicles. Okay. Again, I'm not trying to convince you that you are a Breitenberg vehicle, just to point out that in the history of AI, uh, one of the most interesting aspects of the history of AI and where it's going, and robotics as well, is not just to create useful machines that will replace human workers and produce yet another technology. Robots, unlike most other technologies, challenge some of our fundamental assumptions about who we are and how we work and how we are different from other animals and possibly intelligent machines. I'll ask you to just keep that idea in the back of your mind as we carry on. Okay. All right. So um, back to the 1980s for a moment. Um, we talked about Eliza last time, which is a whole was a whole bunch of if then else statements. Um, uh, it was a chatbot made up of a whole bunch of if then else statements. Most uh, AI programs up to the 1980s had that form. They were sort of traditional code, um, and they just had more or less complicated if then else statements. But obviously, dating much further back, it was already known that whatever the human brain is, it doesn't work that way. The first obvious difference between brains and a whole bunch of if-then-else statements is the brain is a parallel machine, which today we'd probably call a parallel computer. Your brain is taking in information from the world on thousands or billions of parallel channels, depending on how you count. Combining that incoming information in some way with internal state and memory and emotion and so on, and then producing signals that flow out to trillions upon trillions of muscle fibers in your body all the time. So the fact that the brain is massively parallel, um, again, not quite in the 1980s, but, but really it, it, got, uh, it really started to catch steam in the 1980s was this idea of what became known as a neural network, which was a different kind of computer program. It was a computer program that was meant to simulate biological brains by performing parallel computations. So in any neural network, as I mentioned already, you have sort of this input layer, you have a whole bunch of neurons in parallel and they're capturing information from a YouTube video uh, that contains a kitten, or in the case of a robot, it's capturing light or temperature from the world, transforming those signals in parallel and pushing a whole bunch of transformed signals to the output layer. 
In the case of uh, in the case of machine learning, that output layer is usually uh, signaling whether there's a cat or a human in the image. And as we just saw in the Breitenberg vehicles, a neural network uh, at the output layer, those values are being used to drive the motors of the robot. And as I mentioned, the difference between robots and AI is that the values arriving at the motors cause the robot to act, which cause changes, which cause changes arriving at the sensor layer. In the case of our, uh, um, uh, a machine learning or AI algorithm, things usually stop at the output layer. Okay, so that was uh, so that was neural networks in the 1980s, and um, uh, the history of uh, the history of neural networks was kind of interesting, interesting because after they were first introduced, they were kind of laughed off the stage. Everybody thought they were ridiculous. This was a ridiculous way to try and instantiate intelligent behavior. Clearly, Eliza and some other programs at the time were doing so well at fooling humans. It looked like a bunch of if-then-else statements were more likely to pass the Turing test and fool a human into thinking they were intelligent than this weird... Uh, model of human brains. So um, for the eight, 1980s through the 1990s and into about the middle 2000s, neural networks were not taken seriously by anyone in the AI field except two or three people who carried on all the way through and eventually rebranded neural networks as deep neural networks. Why are they called deep? Because you can see in this cartoon here, we have an input layer here, we have an output layer here, and we have a deep set of layers in between. These are known as hidden layers. If you don't know what that means or how neural networks work, that's fine. We're not going to cover neural networks in much detail in this course. Obviously, there are sister courses to this one here at UVM that focus specifically on deep learning uh, and so on. It's an interesting um, lesson about uh, AI research and science in general is that it is a marathon, not a sprint. It takes certain ideas decades um, until eventually they prove useful. And I think neural networks are probably the most the most extreme example of that, at least in our part of the scientific enterprise of AI uh, and robotics. Okay, so um, neural networks were not very popular and then became extremely uh, popular in the last decade or 15 years or so. Which is interesting, again, when we look back over the history of artificial intelligence, because popularity in AI has waxed and waned ever since 1956 and even before that. Um, and sort of a meme has ar uh, uh, arisen around this idea known as AI winters. So AI is super hard, as, uh, and robotics is super hard, as you'll probably find out in this course. Every once in a while, we make some progress, and the most dramatic example of that was the recent uh, improvement in deep neural networks. But after that improvement, sometimes the momentum seems to uh, uh, wane a little bit and pessimism starts to creep in and AI retreats back into unpopularity. The public is often afraid of the technology and it sort of goes into hiding for a decade or two before someone makes another advance and we're back into an AI summer. Hans Moravec, who is a very famous roboticist back in the 1980s, uh, described why these AI winters happen or one of the reasons why, which is if you want to do AI research or robotics research, you have to write a proposal to the government to get funding to do so. DARPA. Uh, which is the U.S. military uh, research wing, uh, funds a lot of work in AI and research. And obviously, uh, if you want to get funded, you need to maybe exaggerate a little bit about what you think you're likely to be able to accomplish if you get some funding. If you get funding from DARPA, the next time you ask for money, obviously you need to promise something more than you did before. Otherwise, why should they give you money again? Which leads to this uh, unfortunate feedback loop um, where everyone gets caught up in a web of increasingly exaggerating what you promise to do in AI if you get funded. Okay. Um, eventually that, that leads into hype and over-exaggeration over and hype and the funding collapses uh, and the, the public starts to get an idea of what's going on and becomes pessimistic or maybe even fear, fearful of the technology. 
Okay, um, that's all I'm going to say about AI Winters. Again, you can go check out the Wikipedia page. There's lots of pub popular science books about AI Winters and Summers and why people think they occurred. What season are we in at the moment? Winter, summer, spring, fall. Are we enjoying an AI high summer or are we suffering as a society through an AI winter? What would you say is the general public's current outlook on artificial intelligence? Summer, Christopher says summer, okay. Nick says the public's outlook uh, uh, is somewhat negative at the moment. Maybe we're in an AI fall. Okay, some believe we're still in a high summer. You can sense in the, the public, uh, in the media reports about AI, there's a little bit of pessimism growing about AI. Uh, some of it is related to, uh, right, these very larger than life CEOs, which are promising uh, some amazing things from AI in the not too distant future. So the social, you know, pessimism around social media is kind of connected with AI. Obviously, these two technologies have kind of become intertwined recently. Maybe the public's a little bit wary. What are some other public concerns about AI and robotics at the moment? There's the ever-present concern about robotics that we're going to reinvent the Terminator and the robots are going to wipe us all out. That's been here since the very beginning. Uh, which may or may not happen, we'll see. But what are some other sort of more, uh, some more practical down to earth concerns? Replacing jobs, humans not having control, job security. We already mentioned uh, industrial robots replacing industrial human workers. So the economic concerns are always there. Some of you may be following the ethical AI or a fair or unfair AI debate. So AIs that are trained on human uh, data seem to uh, inherit a lot of our biases and stereotypes. In retrospect, maybe that's not so surprising. So clearly there's a lot of enthusiasm about AI at the moment, but there's also a fair bit of pessimism over the last few years, which is maybe very well deserved. And maybe, maybe we are entering another AI fall. We will see. Okay. All right. Again, a great, great discussion, but let's, uh, in the interest of time, move on. Okay. So just to finish our discussion about the history uh, of AI, we've touched on a few branches here. I keep mentioning AI and robotics. This is just to keep in mind that there, generally, from the general public's point of view, this is all one field. But when you dive in a little bit, there are important differences between AI methods like neural networks, uh, which is over here, connectionism, and robotics. In robotics, there's lots of different kinds of robotics. We've already talked about industrial robots, which are, uh, uh, which are, uh, which do the same thing over and over again. We're going to spend a lot of time in this class talking about evolving robots. There are some other branches that we are not going to talk about in this class because we won't have time. Uh, one of them is developmental robotics. Uh, and this is the idea uh, that comes from developmental psychology. Developmental psychology studies how human infants gradually mature into human adults. And that kind of human development can be built into robots. So rather than viewing our robots as vehicles or organisms, maybe we should view our robots as uh, ch helpless children or toddlers that interact with their world and gradually learn how to operate in the world safely and efficiently. Biorobotics is a field that's related to evolutionary robotics, but a little bit different. In biorobotics, the idea is to focus on a particular organism and build a robot that mimics that organism uh, as closely as possible. Some of you may know um, Spot, Boston Dynamics Robot Dog. Obviously, a lot of the biomechanics of Spot are based on actual dogs. Spot is more or less about the size of a large dog. The anatomy of the legs of Spot are based more or less on dog legs uh, and so on. So that is taking inspiration from one particular species and building it into robots. Developmental robotics takes inspiration from humans and how they develop from infants into adults. In evolutionary robotics, we are going to take inspiration not from the product 
any product of evolution, like any one species. Instead, we are going to take inspiration from the process of evolution, evolution itself. And as you'll see in evolutionary robotics, often we evolve things that don't look anything like organisms you might find uh, in nature. We will talk a little bit later in this course about swarm robotics, creating groups of robots where they can do something that would be beyond the ability of any one uh, robot. Okay, so what really is the line that divides robots from AI? It's the fact that things on this side of the line have a body and they can use that body to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Motor action, sensory repercussion. That does not exist on the non-embodied side of the line. Notice that I don't say physical and non-physical. I'm using this term embodied. The robot that you're building in PyBullet already is not physical. It exists in a virtual world. But as you'll see uh, next week, or maybe it's the week after when you add sensors and motors, you will have a robot that is embodied but non-physical. It can push against its virtual world and observe the sensory repercussions from that virtual world. Okay, any questions about that before we switch over and focus more on this concept of uh, embodied cognition? No? Okay, so um, what exactly is this idea of embodiment? Um, the term embodiment actually comes from uh, philosophy and psychology, and it is, again, this idea of embodiment is meant to militate against Cartesian dualism, right? Descartes said there is the soul, the mind, the I, the pronoun I, whatever that thing is, it's different from the body. The body is just a tool that lets the soul get around and do things. The body is kind of, I don't know, temporary, dirty, it's, it's in the way, it eventually dies off, but the soul is forever. That, that religious approach to mind and body in the West has become secularized and is now thought of as mind and body, that they are distinct. But the body in a lot of Western thought is still a second class citizen. It is viewed as something that is um, an obstruction to intelligence. A lot of Western thinking places abstract cognition like mathematics or poetry uh, as sort of the highest ideal. And those ideals are, as you would think, are sort of as far from the body as you can possibly get. Mathematics and poetry is pure thought in motion, right? We're always struggling to reach beyond or above the body. Embodiment, this idea from philosophy and psychology, argues the opposite. The body is not an obstruction to intelligence. It is a platform or a facilitator. It makes intelligence happen. Okay, that, it, uh, that uh, uh, in itself is an abstract concept. So let's concretize that idea in AI and robotics. Okay, the way we're gonna do this to illustrate this idea of embodiment is we're gonna look at some of the building blocks of intelligence. So when we were playing the vehicles game a few minutes ago, I asked you to propose things that distinguish you from vehicles. Um, and some of you gave answers like, for example, pattern recognition. We need to recognize friend from foe, familiar from unfamiliar out in the world. That's an important thing. Um, so we're gonna look at some of these building blocks of intelligence and we're going to look at attempts to turn that building block of intelligence into an intelligent machine that exhibits that behavior we're going to look at two different uh two different solutions non-embodied solutions and embodied solutions and in looking at these pairs of solutions to or these pairs of attempts to instantiate or build some building block of intelligence into a machine, I want you to pay attention to the differences. Okay, let's start with pattern recognition. This is sort of an obvious one. Anything that isn't able to recognize patterns in its world is clearly not intelligence. We can define pattern recognition a little more carefully. We can say, or at least one part of pattern recognition is if we're thinking about vision, looking at things, you need to be able to recognize the boundary around the thing you're trying to recognize and segment or separate it from everything else in the field. 
This is known in computer vision as image segmentation. So here's an example. Like uh, We give our pattern recognizer an image of Marilyn Monroe, and you can see this non-embodied neural network picking out or gradually segmenting Marilyn Monroe, everything that belongs to Marilyn Monroe in this picture, from everything else. This was one of the most difficult problems in computer science. People have been working on this since 1956, and it was only, uh, it took them 50 years until about the mid 2000s with improvements to deep learning and neural networks to get a neural network to be able to tell you by painting pixels, which part of this image belongs to Marilyn Monroe and which part doesn't. So I crossed out here, I left the is, because uh, this just shows uh, how recently this has happened. I've been teaching this class for a while. I used, before the deep learning revolution, it, it is or it was the most difficult problem out there. It's taken 50 years to solve this problem. It is a very difficult problem to solve if I hold you down, you are not allowed to move or even move your eyes, and I am going to present the image of Marilyn Monroe onto your visual field, and you have to tell me which parts of the image are Marilyn Monroe or not. You cannot use your body in any way to recognize this pattern. That's, so a deep neural network that solves this problem is a non-embodied solution to the image segmentation problem. So far, so good? Okay, let's take the same problem, pattern recognition or image segmentation, and look at an embodied solution to this problem. Uh, it's a robot, not surprisingly. So a machine that has a body, it is embodied, and this embodied machine can push against its world, literally, and observe how the world pushes back. So this is a baby bot. It was reported back in the early uh, 2000s. As you can see in sort of the cartoon uh, drawing of BabyBot here. BabyBot has two cameras uh, and it has a single arm that it can move and that's, that's about it. So a little bit more complicated than a Breitenberg vehicle but not that much more complicated. The important thing about COG compared to a neural network is obviously that it physically interacts with the scene that it is looking at. Right? In this case, the neural network is not able to reach out and touch Marilyn Monroe or any other humans or any other objects. It has to learn from a distance. Imagine if we taught our human children this way. If we strapped them down and presented them with millions of images and text, but we never allowed them to play with blocks or uh, pet the kitty or do anything physical with the world, obviously it would be an extremely cruel thing to do. But aside from that, you can ask, how well would that child learn about its world? The, ab the ability to recognize or distinguish dangerous patterns from patterns of opportunity compared to baby bot, which as the name implies, baby. This is actually a developmental robotics experiment. They are treating baby bot as a baby. Baby bot is going to start with very little knowledge about the world and by interacting with the world like small children do, we are going to hope that BabyBot um, uh, learns something about its world in general, but solves the image segmentation problem in particular. Okay, so BabyBot has these two cameras. They're going to use the, uh, the video feeds arriving at these two cameras not to do stereo vision. So that's why you might have two eyes so you can see the distance. They actually threw away the, all that information. They combined the two video fields and they tagged each pixel in the resulting single video field. They tagged those pixels as either uh, gray or black. So they threw away depth, they threw away color. Each pixel is either gray or black. A gray pixel represents that there was no motion detected at that position over the last tenth of a second. A black pixel represents there was motion detected at that particular position over the last tenth of a second. That's what's being visualized in the right-hand column here. So BabyBot can only see motion or lack of motion. So at the moment, uh, BabyBot is seeing mostly gray. Everything in its world is not moving. Um, there's actually, a, I guess, a panel before this panel where BabyBot starts with its arm outside its field of view. 
Baby bot can send uh, can send torques. Torques, which as you'll remember are uh, rotational forces. It can supply torques to the motors in its arm, and when it supplies torques or it supplies those rotational forces, its arm is going to start. Uh, its arm is going to start moving. BabyBot knows nothing about the world. It doesn't even know anything about itself. All it knows is that it can send these numbers to these motors. And when BabyBot does, just depending, picks torques at random, occasionally its arm will just enter its field of view by chance. And the moment that its arm enters its field of view, suddenly a whole bunch of the pixels turn black. There is a blob of motion in BabyBot's vision, and everything else is still uh, is still is non-moving. BabyBot might then stop sending torques to its arm, which means its arm stops moving, which means that black blob suddenly turns gray, and its whole world goes gray again. BabyBot might notice that it might send torques to its arm again, and suddenly that black blob appears. So BabyBot is already learning something. What is it learning? You have to put yourself in BabyBot's shoes for a moment. It sees blobs of motion appear and disappear. BabyBot can send torques to its motors. What is BabyBot learning at this moment in time? Or what, what, what could it potentially learn at this point in time? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. The torques move the blob, as, as George says, right? And Missy says what its arm looks like. Yes, but BabyBot doesn't even know it has an arm yet. So George mentioned the, the nerve, the, the, use the noun, the blob, right? It's all BabyBot knows. There's this blob, this black thing, which seems to appear whenever I turn my arm. At the very beginning of BabyBot's life, the very first thing it learns is a relationship between action and reaction and sensory repercussion. It learns a particular action sensory repercussion relationship. When I send these torques, this thing appears. So it's going to, let's imagine that BabyBot comes up with a word for this thing and the word it's going to use is arm. It says, okay, I'm going to call this thing arm. The noun arm is actually referring to a verb or it's referring to a process. If I do this, then this happens. That's what arm means to baby bot, not the shape or not anything about the static structure of the arm itself. This is already a non-intuitive way to think about uh, cognition, the way we think. If I were to ask you to describe what's a chair, or what's a cup, or what's a computer, or what's your best friend, what's a bicycle, what's a window, you'd probably give me a description about what it looks like. A window is usually rectangular, um, you can see objects through it, um, you, you give me sort of, or a, a chair has you know these uh, these vertical things that allow it to, to stay upright and it has a flat uh, surface that you can sit on and so on. Most of your descriptions of the noun chair are going to be other nouns: legs, seat, rectangular, flat, perpendicular, uh, adjectives, and nouns. But from BabyBot's point of view, its first noun which is arm, is described with verbs or processes. When I do this, this happens. Okay, so BabyBot has learned something now about its world, which is what this thing called arm is, and so it's happily playing with arm, playing with self. It could be self or arm. Suddenly, when it sends random torques, something new happens. Its hand just happens to come into contact with another object, and now this black blob before, which was arm, is different. The shape of the blob has changed. There's now this additional blob on the end. What does baby what what does BabyBot learn at this point, or what could BabyBot learn at this point? What is different about this new blob? 
from BabyBot's point of view. This new blob is different from the first blob, from ARM. How is it different? Christopher, can you retype your question? Your... Aha, Ben says he doesn't, BabyBot doesn't have direct control. Okay, control, that's an interesting word. The new blob, as George says, is independent of the torque value. This blob, um, this blob isn't a part of BabyBot. It is not a part of BabyBot. Right. So let's go back to action and sensory reaction or sensory repercussion for a moment. Uh, the blob called arm appears, arm, 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 arm. Suddenly it changes into another blob and BabyBot stops sending torques, which means its arm stops moving, which means the arm blob disappears. But if it had happened to come into contact with an apple, like you see here, maybe that apple will continue rolling after the arm stops moving. That is a new experience that BabyBot has never had. There are blobs that can exist independent of torques. BabyBot needs a word for that. So maybe BabyBot comes up with what Ben says is, um, controllable or not controllable. Arm or self is controllable, but there seem to be other things in the world that are out of my control, baby bots control. This is a difficult and horrifying lesson for human children to learn. And as adults, we continue to have to remind ourselves of that lesson. There are a lot of things out there in the world beyond self that we have little to no control over. Where does that lesson come from from BabyBot? It is a literal lesson that arises from its physical interaction with the world. Okay, BabyBot might notice something else. If it keeps moving and it comes into contact with the banana, it says, aha, oh, look what happened. There's some, a new blob that's appeared. It's got a different, it's, the blob has a different shape. But when I, push, when I push that blob, or when that blob appears and I stop sending torques, that 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 blob also disappears it doesn't persist like the other thing did so now there's three blobs one is self i understand that one it disappears it, it appears whenever i move and disappears whenever i stop moving there is another one here that it'll appear sometimes and it'll continue it'll persist even when i stop moving but now there's a third type of blob which doesn't appear whenever I move. It only appears sometimes when I move, when I come into contact with it, but BabyBot doesn't know that. That blob appears sometimes, and it never persists beyond me stopping the torques being sent to my motors. What, what does BabyBot learn from that, or what could BabyBot learn from that? The world is already getting pretty complicated from BabyBot's point of view. What's the difference between the second and third blob that BabyBot has encountered? It's tricky to put yourself in BabyBot's shoes, right? Maybe BabyBot keeps, uh, keeps moving around and comes into contact with other fruits and vegetables in front of it. It comes into contact with the orange here. The orange has a similar property, or this, that, the orange blob seems to have similar properties with the apple blob. And I'm using apple and orange, but remember BabyBot knows nothing about apples and oranges. And the grapes seem to act similarly to the banana or those two blobs seem to act similarly. What, what's going on here? What can BabyBot conclude from this? There is uh, a lot that BabyBot can learn from these four interactions, the interaction with the apple, banana, orange, and grapes. What is it? No? 
What's common from BabyBot's point of view about the apple and the orange blob? Aside from the fact that those blobs persist after BabyBot has touched them. The way the blobs move, yeah. What else? So Matt says the way the blobs move. What else can BabyBot tell about these things that seem to be moving independently of BabyBot? So BabyBot maybe says, I need an, a new term. There is self, this thing, and there's non-self, everything else out there. But among all the non-self stuff, there seems to be two groups. The apple and orange blobs from BabyBot's point of view seem to move similarly, and they move differently from the banana and grapes. How does BabyBot know? If BabyBot comes into contact with, uh, let's see, a lemon, the moment that it comes in contact with the lemon, there's a blob that appears. BabyBot might be able to know something about what's going to happen with the lemon blob in the next time step, given what it knows about apples and oranges. Alexander has figured it out. Movement and shape are related. Blobs that have this kind of shape tend to persist after... I touch them, and things that are do not have this shape, and I need a baby bot says I need a word for this. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna use the word round. Things that are round tend to persist, and things that are not round do not persist. Okay, so baby bot has already learned, has already along this way has already solved the image segmentation problem, and it's actually solved the image segmentation problem in an easy way by just computing movement in its visual field, and trust me that this is an easier thing to do than create a neural network to recognize Marilyn Monroe or segment Marilyn Monroe out from the background. By creating an embodied agent, it, effort, it, it is easy. The body is not making it harder to segment objects. The body is making it easier to segment objects from the background simply by acting on them. The body not only makes Im image segmentation easier, it also is allowing BabyBot to start to learn many, many more things about the world than any neural network could ever do from looking at uh, images or all of YouTube, every video on YouTube at a distance. Interacting with the world, the action and sensory reaction is the raw material on which all animals and humans learn and build up uh, intelligent behavior. We do not yet know how to do that for robots or AI very well. Okay, so the body is a facilitator or an enabler of intelligent action. It is not an obstruction to intelligent action. We got two minutes left, so let's just introduce a second building block of intelligence, planning. Any animal or human or robot that cannot plan for the future is not going to survive very well and is probably not intelligent. Right? Um, planning is something that uh, has been solved in non-embodied systems um, for quite a while, and it allowed Deep Blue, the computer you see here on the right, to beat uh, Gary uh, Kasparov, the world champion, uh, 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 the world grandmaster in chess uh, a while back. Anybody, any chess fans here? When did Deep Blue win its first game against Kasparov? Deep Blue won its first game, but then lost a match. But then a short time later in a rematch, Deep Blue won, won a match against Kasparov. And from that point forward, machines tended to be world champions rather than humans. Very nice, Luke. Yep, exactly. Back in February of 1996, using a sophisticated planning algorithm, Deep Blue was able to beat Kasparov. We're not going to go into the details, but very basically, Deep Blue builds a game tree. Deep Blue considers every possible move that it can make. And for each of those moves, it considers every possible, uh, re uh, every, per every possible responding move that the human opponent can make. For each of those, the computer thinks of every response it can make and so on. And this builds a huge tree of moves. And that is Deep Blue planning ahead. 
if I do this and my opponent does that, then I can do that, and that's likely a good thing. I'll give that a good score. But if I do this and my opponent does that, there's little I can do in response. I'll give that part of the game tree a low score. Deep Blue then performs actions that influence the action of the game towards parts of the planning tree that are in Deep Blue's favor. Again, a fascinating subject in and of itself. We don't have time for that today. We'll finish with Kasparov and Deep Blue uh, for today. A reminder that you have a quiz that is due at 11.59 p.m. tonight. You're working on assignment two. For those of you that are still struggling with assignment one, please do come and see uh, Amanda or I. Have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you back here Thursday morning. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.